Hepburn, I'm Todd, my wife Leah is here, uh, my two girls Natalie and Tori, and my parents show So it's all good. Um, if you can't see who my dad is, you need glasses. Because we look pretty much the same. I have a beard, he doesn't. But it's good to be here. It's been great to be here with, with you since September. Yes, I did come to the Cosmo Civic Center a few times three years ago when you were there. Um, as Kevin was saying, I worked with the Mennonite Brethren uh, Conference here in Saskatchewan. I did that for 15 years as a, in a volunteer basis. Um, and then right at the end, I was the chairman of the board for the executive board. So I have a lot of experience in uh, the fun stuff of church, the business side of it. A lot of you probably are like, oh, that's probably the most boring part of that. But, uh, as you see in your bulletin tonight, I chose two words that we're going to be talking about tonight for a little bit. Finished and anointed. Finished and anointed. As I was thinking about this, I've been thinking about these two words for a long time. I met Corey Johnston. We, we don't know exactly how long ago it was. We are thinking about seven or eight years ago. I, uh, he came to our church in Hepburn, the Midnight Brother Church there. I turned around and I saw this bald guy and I'm going, hey, we're brothers. <laughs> a little bit taller, quite better looking than I am. But hey, it's great. He and I became really good friends. We still are. He comes over for coffee every once in a while. Two or three hours later, we're still talking about the Bible. So I really enjoyed those times. The Spirit really stirs up within me when we are together. And so, um, but these, these two words, finished and anointed, I've been thinking about for at least that long, maybe longer. What does it mean? Finish and anoint it. So we're going to look through that a little bit. There's a few verses I want to share with you. First off, the start. These are very important to me. Um, and these are something that I have really touched my heart the last little bit. Doris, we're going to start with actually Galatians 1. Sorry to throw you off there a little bit. Uh, these, these verses have hit home with me. Um, and they're not, not exactly the nicest verses in the Bible, but for me, they're very important. Let's read Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 6, and going to verse 9. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. That is a powerful, powerful thing for me. If I speak anything contrary to you tonight, other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm supposed to be excommunicated. That hit me with a ton of bricks when I first read it. It really made me think, what do I share? What do I teach with people? Am I following what Paul says is the gospel? The grace of Christ for it is the gospel. Hebrews 4.12, another past, or another verse that I really, really enjoy. Hebrews is an interesting book. It's, a, it's just a, a, since I've, since Corey and I met, God has really flipped my world upside down. I'm not saying that Corey is the problem, just that he brought some things to life that I was thinking were very much doctrine, and they weren't. 
See, I, I've been raised in a Christian home all my life. I became a Christian when I was five years old. I'm 47 now, so you can probably do the math how long I've been in the church. A long time. But over those years, I've learned some things that I thought were the gospel, and they were not. They were the doctrine or traditions of men. So, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As you get to know me, you will understand that I'm a deep thinker. I look at Greek, I look at Hebrew, and I just love it. And some of you are going, oh man, not one of those guys. But yes, it's one of those guys. Okay, so the word of God there is actually the declaration of God, or the utterance of God. Something spoken of God is sharper than to any two-edged sword, and it'll pierce through to your heart. So after tonight, I will know how your heart is. And that's tough to say, but I will know what your heart is like. But you're probably thinking, well, Todd, that's, that's pretty harsh right off the start. First of all, you're, you're hitting yourself pretty hard for what you're preaching. You're hitting me hard to say what my heart's like. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? Yes, it is a little bit hard. But you have to remember what Romans 8.1 says. Can anybody tell me what Romans 8.1 says? Condemnation. Speak a little louder, Jake. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. That's right. If we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation to you. If we speak about a different gospel, you will feel heavy when you leave the church. So, let's see how this works. Again, remember, you are in Christ if you believe in him. So we're going to talk about the first word, finish. What does finish mean? And where do we find finish, the word finish? If you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19, we're going to find out. John chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. If you hear me sniffling, I'm sorry. I've had a cold for about two weeks now. Just getting over it. Um, we will get through this. God's giving me amazing, amazing vocal cords the last few days. So it's been good. I've been sniffly, even coughing the last two weeks. But we're all, we're all good. So we see here, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. As we look at communion and what that means, and we're going to go through communion later tonight, I'm going to read some scriptures for you that you might not think about when we have communion. But what does the word finished mean? So we start at verse 16 of John chapter 19. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus. Therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Godotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was in, written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic, 
Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved near, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of those sour wine upon a branch of hyssop, brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I want to look at verse 28, especially tonight. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things have already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So we see that all things, and in the Greek, the words there is all things. All things had already been accomplished to fulfill all the scripture or to perfect all the scripture, as the Greek says. So we see from Genesis to Malachi that everything in there pointing to Jesus was accomplished. Every prophecy, everything that was a foreshadow of Jesus coming dying is fulfilled. Or as the Greek, the word fulfilled there should say the perfect, perfect the scriptures. He said, then it is finished. So what does that mean for us? It is finished. You've probably heard that before the finished work of Jesus Christ. See, if you look at the Old Testament, there are a lot of things there that are hard to understand. A lot of things that are sort of a shadow of things to come. A shadow of things that we cannot really see clearly until we see the person of Jesus Christ. All the prophecies, Isaiah 53, all the Psalms, there's prophecies in the Psalms of Jesus Christ coming to die. So we see all the things that were there fulfilled in this one moment in time, the cross of Jesus Christ. So if you read this new, the Old Testament, this is how I sort of figured it out. The Old Testament points to one specific time and place. Everything points to one thing, and that's the cross. See, even from the beginning of time, from when Adam screwed up in the garden and ate the fruit, God the Father said, I am going to send you something down the road, the seed of a woman that's going to take care of us. So as soon as darkness, as soon as everything sin death entered the world, God had an answer for it. God had an answer, and his name was Jesus. That, for me, is a big thing. That means I start where Jesus finished. I start my walk where Jesus finished. 
the things that needed to be finished. He accomplished, fulfilled the law, the Mosaic law that was given. He was a sacrifice. He shed his blood. So that is completely done with at the cross. Death was a big one. That as soon as Adam ate of the tree, death entered the world. And darkness entered the world. And Jesus finished that as well. Because when we see ourselves, and this is where we're going into the anointed part, Jesus paid an ultimate price for us so that we can start from scratch, from point A, and move forward. Point A, again, is the cross. Yes, we, we also have to talk about the power that raised Jesus from the dead. But the main part is the finished work of Jesus Christ. It is the cross. One thing I'll say, Kevin, I think the next building needs air conditioning. <laughs> For us bigger, bigger men, air conditioning is good. Okay? Okay, so when Jesus was on earth, he said a few things as well that he prophesied about himself. Right? He said, this temple will be taken down and torn down, and three days later it will be raised again. Right? So there's also times in the scriptures from Malachi to the cross, there's also prophetic words that Jesus fulfilled there as well. But again, it's that aspect of the finish is our starting point, is our time to rock and roll. Ephesians chapter 1. Last time I preached was in Blaine Lake about a month ago at a Mennonite Brethren Church. I called my oldest daughter up and she panicked on me. She did come up. But I won't call anybody up tonight because they told me, I won't come down. Really, I won't. But what we see here is an interesting, interesting passage. What I use them for my oldest daughter was the kingdom of light. And some of this you will hear about as we go forward. See, the kingdom of light is very important to us. That's where we are. We are in the kingdom of light. We are no longer in the domain of darkness. We have been transferred into the kingdom of light. But Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, summing up all things in Christ, things in heaven, things on earth, in him, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end, which we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you have also listening, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. <coughs> Excuse me. There is some amazing, amazing sermons in this passage, but we won't touch them all tonight. I want to go to verse 13. So remember, always remember, this is where we're starting, is the, is the cross, right? But when we believe in him and what he's done for us on the cross, we are sealed in him. Verse 
we are sealed in him by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into us and seals us and reminds us of our inheritance. Reminds us of who we are, what we have, and what he has done for us. He has done some amazing things in my own life. Don't really have time to go into them tonight, but he has torn out a lot of things. I'll just leave it at that. A lot of things that were not helping me be fruitful. He has pruned me well. But there is an inheritance, and it starts now. Doesn't wait. We, yes, we do have a promise of going to heaven and being with him. But our inheritance starts when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and seals us until we see him face to face. So what does the Holy Spirit do for us? And let me tell you, we could be here all night just talking about that. But let's see how Jesus' own life was affected by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4. This is right after Jesus was baptized. The Holy Spirit came on him and God the Father said, I am well pleased with you. You are my beloved son. I want to let you know, each one of you, before you do anything for God, when you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes on you, God the Father looks at you and says, you are my beloved son and daughter, I am well pleased with you. For me, that was huge. For me, that was a big thing. Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. For 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, let this stone, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whoever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall not... You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he, led to, and he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the surrounding district. And he began teaching in the synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to, the, to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book, and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, 
and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit came on to Jesus, it said he was full of the Holy Spirit, completely full, completely full of the Holy Spirit. And it was, it's always interesting to me, reading this passage, that verse 2 says, he ate nothing for 40 days, and then he found he was hungry. I don't know about you, if I go for an hour without eating, I'm, I'm usually pretty hungry. But it's always interesting to me how that sort of stood out to me one day. Of course, we'd see the devil saying, okay, what God said about you, what God said about you, Jesus, do you believe in? Jesus, God the Father said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus, do you believe this? Because he always brings it up in everything that he says to Jesus. You're the son of God, really? Well, I'll do this then. Well, if you're the Son of God, do this then. If you're the Son of God, do this then. And of course, Jesus resisted him, rebuked him, and he went away. What does it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit and be in power? That is a loaded question for a guy who went to a Mennonite Brother Church for a long time. I went to the Alliance, I've gone to other denominations. But what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Jesus pretty much answers that in verse 18. And after that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind. To set those who are oppressed, set free those who are oppressed, Proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's what it means to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. We look at Jesus and we call him Jesus Christ. Throughout the scriptures, after this portion of scripture, people call Jesus Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures. So I did some research on what it means, what the Christ title means. Christ title means anointed. Jesus the anointed. So if Jesus the Christ means Jesus anointed, what does it mean for us in Acts chapter 4. Sorry, Acts chapter 11. Let's go there next. Starting at verse 19. Acts chapter 11. So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to sorry, Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to the Jews alone. But they were, there were some of them, men, of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number believed, turned to the Lord, the news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with all resolute, resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. 
and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him back to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable members, sorry, considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They are first called Christians in Antioch. So if we take that first part of that word, Christ, and we put anointed in there, the first time that people were called anointed was in Antioch. So if they were considered Christians back then, or anointed ones in chapter 11, what are we? We are also anointed. We are anointed. That hit me between the eyes, my father. Because it took me back to chapter 4 of Luke, and it, it brought me to my knees. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Todd, for he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. What has he called you to do? Some of you are looking at me and say, Oh, I kinda I could never do that. I could never do what you do, Tom. Little do you know, ten years ago. I couldn't see myself doing this either. I'm an introvert. I was very shy. I had insecurity problems. I could not see myself doing this either. I could not see myself teaching the word of the Lord. But here I am, standing before you, because he has anointed me. Now, I'm not saying everybody is called to be up here, but what are you called to be? <coughs> Our brother talked about giftings before. And I'm, I was laughing to myself because that's where I'm passionate about. Each one of you, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, brings certain giftings and strengths to each of us each of you. The sad part is, less than 50% of you know what your giftings are. Some of you know what your giftings, and don't know how to use them. That's okay. That is completely fine. Because that's why we come together. My job, one of my jobs standing up here is to get you ready for your ministry. And that completely be something completely different than mine. But my job here is to encourage you, to edify you, to lift you up, and to get you ready for your ministry. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for it is easy and light. See, sometimes we we think that we have to take this big burden on, onto ourselves, and we don't have to do that. Jesus did that at the cross. Jesus finished that for us. He took all the curses onto himself at the cross. So that we can have the blessings. 
And let me tell you, if you go into Deuteronomy chapter 29, there's a whole lot of blessings there that we don't know about. Those curses do not belong to us, by the way. There's blessings and curses in Deuteronomy 29. Those curses Jesus took from us. We are no longer cursed. God is not mad at us. He has taken the wrath. Jesus took that wrath for us. Because if you look at this Luke chapter 4 passage, Jesus stopped at a certain point and didn't finish that place in Isaiah. Because he talks in the next verse is the wrath of God. And Jesus stopped before he got to that point. Because he knew in a few days, in a few weeks, he was going to take all that wrath onto himself at the cross. Now, how do we take this, what I've shared with you tonight, and how do we go from here? That is a good question. I want you to remember that everything has been finished for you by Jesus Christ. And he also said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will send somebody to you that will give you the power to be anointed. Yes, is it scary? Yeah, it's scary. But the first time I get up before somebody to preach, my knees were knocking. Right? I was sweating. I was not really enjoying my time up front. But Jesus said, I want you to do this. See, he will never give you a task or a gift that is too big for you with the Holy Spirit. There's the disclaimer right there. The Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is powerful enough for you to do your ministry. Now, what is your ministry? What do you have a passion for? Is it for people outside the church that you want to go to Tim Hortons or places that you just like here in Walmart, you turn around and you cannot help but share the gospel with somebody. We need you. We need you. You are anointed to do that. Maybe yours is doing something behind the scenes that nobody really sees about. There are a lot of people that just love and are passionate for that. We need you as well. You are anointed to do that. Every gift is an important part of the body of Christ. If you think it's a pushing a broom, I do that for a living. It's great. You'd be surprised how many conversations you strike up with somebody over a piece of garbage. My passion, though, is for this body. I want each and every one of you to know what your giftings are, what you've been anointed to do. Because when we find that out, the gates of hell not stand against us. That is a promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Are you scared? Perfect love drives out fear. You have to realize that God loved you so much that he gave up his son so that you can become sons and daughters of God. See, we've been taken from the darkness and the domain of darkness and transferred into the light, the kingdom of light. That is completely amazing.
if you look at me, I'm nothing special. I'm balding, I'm a little fat, right? I'm the youngest of three boys. My two older brothers are retired from their careers already. I haven't even started my life. I always joke about that because I actually have happened. But that's okay. God has put me in places where he can use me because of anointing. But I didn't realize that until a few years ago. I am anointed because the Spirit of the Lord is up. The Spirit of the Lord has filled me up and I can proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I can set free those who are oppressed. I can pray for people and they'll, their sight will be recovered. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives, to preach the gospel, the finished work of Jesus Christ, Him crucified, Him raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit in my life is simply amazing. As we move into communion tonight, I just want everybody to close their eyes and uh, think for a couple minutes, what are you passionate about and what are you going to do? Now, I don't care if you're five years old, 105 years old, God will still use you. God will still use you. Another thing to always remember. God loves you so much. He is well pleased with you. And he wants the best for you. Even when the world and darkness seems like it's all around us, you will not be rushed. Because the Holy Spirit's there.